birthday and happy anniversary that it is painfully awkward to sit three feet in front of someone while you're singing happy birthday. It's like, do I look at them or look away? What is going on here? So that was two things. Always put your death threats into context, and it's awkward singing happy birthday when you're sitting at someone's feet. There you go. Please take your Bible and find the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. This morning we're going to be in verses 1 through 6. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. And when you find it, would not mind standing to honor God and His Word. Uh, and then we'll read, and then we'll pray. And, hey, we got, we got to the sermon pretty quick. I got a whole hour. All right. I got an hour. Amen. 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 <laughs> Don't waste it. Okay. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, beginning of verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered up unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaks. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we give our hearts to you this morning to receive instruction from your word. Glorify yourself. Use me as your vessel, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now, I realize... What I am about to say for most every Christian really is a, a no-brainer. For every Christian, this ought to be a no-brainer. But here it is anyway. One thing that makes us distinctively Baptist, and I'll remind you that when I say distinctively Baptist, I mean distinctively biblical. One thing that makes us distinctively Baptist is that we believe that God exists. Amen. Amen. Baptists believe in God. And you would think that that would just be a given in the church. But today, I'm not really that sure. I mean, there are some people who think that this is up for debate. I have personally encountered men and women in the church. They're not so sure the Bible is inspired or trustworthy. I've encountered men and women in the church who think that the universe that we live in, that the world that we live on, live on just happened, and that life and everything that we know to be just came to be through the process of evolution while also claiming to be a Christian, claiming to be a child of God. But really, if you say that you believe evolution, that reveals that you have serious reservations about the existence of God. Why would I say that? Because if you believe evolution, you believe a theory that postulates that God is not necessary for everything to exist. So we just can't take it for granted that everyone in the church, everyone who calls himself or calls herself a Christian, actually believed in God. There's such a thing in the world today as a cultural Christian. A cultural Christian. These are people, and, and they claim the name of Christ simply to identify themselves as someone who has a social conscience. And all too often, they follow the teaching of Jesus, not because they believe that he is the Son of God and the Savior of mankind, but they hold him to be some great moral teacher. Uh, they see Jesus as a social engineer in the vein of someone like Gandhi or Nelson Mandela. Their association with the church and their association with the word of God, the Bible, their association to Christ has nothing to do with a genuine belief in God. Rather, they're social justice warriors. They hold the church as an agent of change in society. They hold the church as something which will bring about their idea of a social utopia. See, they only see the church... They only see Jesus as a means to an end. And what you find in people who believe this, what you find in churches who hold to this uh, type of belief in God, is this strong inclination for social work. They are strong proponents of welfare. They 
there are strong proponents of soup kitchens, clothes closets, food pantries, things like this. And there is nothing wrong with these things. So don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not preaching out against uh, reaching out to our, uh, our brother in need with help. We are called to go out and minister to the needs of people. We're the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, and we are called to do that. Amen. <laughs> but the primary mission of the church is to preach Jesus Christ. Amen. The primary mission, the number one mission, the one thing that precedes or supersedes everything else in the church is to preach Jesus Christ so that people can be saved. Because it's only through Christ Jesus that God can bring any real change to people's lives. And that real change will result in real changes to their circumstances, which will lift them up, lift them up above all those things uh, that we're trying to help meet me. Where social work becomes something other than fulfilling the mission of the church is when it becomes the sole purpose of the church. The point being, when a church is nothing more than some sort of privatized social service without directing people to Christ, then the benefit of the church is limited. And here's how it is limited, to temporarily relieving some tough circumstances, and that for just a select few people. Remember what Jesus said, the poor you'll have with you always. There are more poor people in the world than there are rich or even middle class. And what that means is that if we limit ourselves to simply social work, we're only going to have a very limited effect in our surrounding society. But the primary mission of the church is to preach Jesus Christ. And if we'll faithfully preach Jesus Christ, we'll impact not only our community, but the entire world. Amen. Amen. When you have people in the church who don't really believe that God exists, who don't really believe that Jesus is the Son of God... And their only reason for being in the church is to uh, practice good works or to, to, to say that they do good deeds. And really, that amounts to a conscience salve. Or worse, there are people who come to church and the reason why they're involved in church is they want to pad their resume or they want to pad their college application so that they get into a better school. And when you have a church like this, you don't really have a church. All you have is goodwill with some religious traffic. That's right. And there are churches out there that are like this. Uh, their, their claims to belief in God, uh, they are suspect. <coughs> but that's not the case in the Baptist church. One thing that makes us distinctively Baptist is that we believe God exists and that he rewards those men and women who diligently seek him. Article 2 of the Baptist Faith and Message says this. There is one and only one living and true God. He is an intelligent, spiritual, and personal being, the creator, redeemer, preserver, and ruler of the universe. God is infinite in holiness in all of the perfections. God is all-powerful and all-knowing, and his perfect knowledge extends to all things, past, present, and future, including future <coughs> decisions of his free creatures. To him we owe the highest love, reverence, and obedience. The eternal triune God reveals himself to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, with distinct personal attributes, but without division of nature, essence, or being. And now all that, <clears throat> really, is just a, a long-winded and fancy way of saying this. We believe in God. <coughs> we believe in God. We believe that God exists. Uh, we believe that God is an intelligent being that has a personality. Why do we believe this? Because we're created in His image, right. and we have the possibility... For being intelligent and having a personality. And I purposely say the possibility because some people fall short in that area. <laughs> I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just trying to be honest up here, right? That is true. We believe God exists. That he has personality. Uh, that he has intelligence because we exist with personality and intelligence. And we are created in his image. We believe God exists in complete holiness. Which is why sinful and fallen people cannot abide in his presence. How do I know this? How do we know that we're sinful and fallen? Because we have a conscience, folks. Every person on the planet has a conscience. Right. And if there seems to be someone who has no conscience, all that means is that they've seared their conscience against all their evil deeds so that they can do them without reservation. Amen. Every being on the planet has a conscience. That not only makes us aware of the existence of God, but it convinces us that he's holy and we are not. Amen. Romans chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. 
For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, that means that we, every person, instinctively does what's written in the law, folks. That's what the Apostle Paul says. He says, when the Gentiles, which have no law, do by nature the things contained in the law. Those having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. That's conscience, folks. Amen. Their conscience also bearing witness, accusing or else excusing one another. Your own conscience, it either condemns you or it excuses you. And by this, you ought to know there is a holy God. And what is more, by your conscience, by your conscience, you ought to know this. Because we are either uh, condemned by our conscience or we're excused by our conscience. And by that, you ought to know this. You're not God. What is this? Thing? I can't remember who said it, but someone once said there are two things I know for certain about God. That he exists and I'm not him. Amen. Right? Just in case you think that you are holy, now according to your own law, which you make up, okay? Because men do this. Women do this. They make up their own moral code and decide for themselves what is right and wrong. And just in case you think that you're righteous by holding to your own moral code, let me, let me just clue you in on this fact because we all do it and we all know it. You don't even keep your own commandments. You don't even keep your own commandments uh, and convictions. Neither do I. That's the failure in man. Mankind, uh, mankind cannot keep God's law. And we don't even keep our own laws. Amen. And besides which, if we were truly righteous, as we want to believe that we are, we wouldn't need a law. Yeah, right. Why? Why would you give yourself a moral code? Because you know you're immoral. Why would we have to write laws and put them in the books and have police and have military and have law enforcement if we were righteous people? If we were righteous people, we would always do what's right. None of those things would be necessary. Amen. We don't even keep our own laws. We make up our own moral codes, especially today. And there's a word for this. It's called self-righteous. Okay? And, of course, Christians are always accused of being self-righteous, even though we're standing in the righteousness of Christ. Because that's the way the world does it. They're too stupid to realize that they're the ones with their own self-righteousness. They just accuse everybody else of being that one. Right? So, especially today, people make up their own moral codes. And they lower their standard of righteousness so low that anyone could clear that bar. John Stott says, it's not hard to claim to be a high jumper if the bar is no more than a couple inches off the ground. <laughs> That's exactly what you have when people set their own standard. That's what people do today. But Stott gives them credit. He says they set it inches off the ground. I think they just lay it on the ground. That's our moral standard. And so we've written ourselves our own moral codes, our own standard of righteousness in our hearts. You know, this is what we believe, and this is what I do, and this is what I don't do, and that's what makes me righteous, even though everything that I do is immoral according to the Word of God. We set our own standard of righteousness, a much lower standard of righteousness than what we find in the Bible, and then we believe that that makes us righteous. Beside, uh, by the way, just so that you will know this, does everybody know what the standard of righteousness in the Bible is? It's Jesus. If your standard of righteousness matches or excels the righteousness that we see in Jesus, then you can claim that you are righteous before God. But good luck with that. <laughs> People believe that by living to their own standard of righteousness, that's what makes them righteous before God. But you're not righteous before God on your own. In reality, these people are not righteous, even if they keep their own law. Because the fact is, we don't keep our own moral code. Do we? No. Do we? How can you say that, preacher? How can you be assured that we don't even keep our own moral codes? How many in here has ever made a New Year's resolution? A New Year's resolution. When did you break that New Year's resolution? For most of you, it was January the 2nd. January. Come on. Come on, right? Our conscience alone is enough for us to know that God exists, that 
inner source of right and wrong. Where do you think that comes from? Baptists do not waver between faith and doubt when it comes to the existence of God. Right? We know for certain that God exists. How do we know? Because our conscience tells us that God exists. But more than this, listen, Baptists know that uh, God exists because we have a personal relationship with him through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Uh, our, our, we're not in here practicing religion, folks. We're in here uh, uh, having relationship with God. That's what makes our fellowship sweet. That's what makes our worship so awesome. We're not in here just going through the motions and practicing a religion. We're here actually worshiping and fellowshipping with our holy God through Jesus Christ, his son. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him to them, he gave the power to become the sons of God. Even those who believe on his name. The Apostle Paul said this, Romans chapter 8, verses 15 and 16. For you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. You've re received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. How do you know that God exists? Well, he's my Abba. He's my Father. I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit indwells. You know, many people have tried to convince me that there is no God. I remember one time I was testifying to someone how the Holy Spirit had delivered me uh, from smoking cigarettes. Okay, I'll admit it. I used to smoke. But none of y'all ever knew me when I smoked, so y'all can't envision that, can you? <laughs> All right. <laughs> so... I had quit smoking. Actually, the Lord delivered me from smoking. And I was trying to convince this person that what delivered me was the Holy Spirit inside me telling me that I didn't need it. That I had Christ. I didn't need those cigarettes, right? And so um, they tell me, no, God didn't deliver you from smoking. You delivered yourself. This God thing is a fantasy. There is no God. There's no God. You don't really, you know, and this is never going to take hold in my life. Because I know. That I know him. You understand? You can come up and try to convince me all day long that God doesn't exist and I don't know him. But it's never going to work because I know him. Amen. You might as well try to convince me that my dad, Robert Dysinger, never existed. It's going to have the same effect, uh, effect because I had a living relationship with my earthly father. Then uh, you want to tell me that he didn't exist? I'm going to call you a fool. And it's the same with our Heavenly Father. You come and tell me that God doesn't exist, even though I know Him, and I've known Him for years and years, and walked with Him for years and years, even though I know Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, I'm going to say, you don't even know what you're talking about. The Spirit bears witness with my spirit. I am a child of God. I'm a child of God. If you know Jesus Christ, you know the Father. That's what Jesus said. John chapter 14, verses 8 and 9. Uh, Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffices us. And Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. Yeah. Every man and woman who has faith in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, they have come into a loving relationship, not only with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the only begotten Son of God, but if you love Jesus Christ and have a relationship with Him, you have a relationship with God the Father. You are a child of God. We're adopted by God through faith. We're adopted by God through faith in the Lord Jesus. We're the children of God. The Spirit of God inhabits us. That's the most intimate relationship you can have with anyone. We are on a personal uh, basis. We have a personal relationship with God. Try to tell me he doesn't exist. He talks to me more than y'all do. Right? <laughs> and if you're skeptical about this, let me just say this again with emphasis. Yes. I know God personally. Amen. Why, he's a close personal friend of mine. Right? <laughs> How's that for a name drop? And so do all my brothers and sisters in Christ. Yes, Lord. And if you have doubts about that, it doesn't do anything to change it. Being, you can be skeptical all you want. I am still a blessed child of my Heavenly Father. Mm -hmm. Me too, brother. 
We are genuine and we are sincere in our belief in God. That makes us distinctively Baptist. Now, I'm not trying to say that only Baptists believe. There are true believers in every denomination. But you can rest assured belief in God the Father, belief in God the Son, belief in God the Holy Spirit. That is alive and well in this Baptist church. That's why we preach and teach the Bible the way that we do. There is no substitute for genuine belief when it comes to preaching the word. Amen? Amen. We're not afraid to preach. We're not afraid to pre preach the book of Genesis and the creation. We're not even afraid to take the book of Revelation literally. <laughs> I'm not afraid to preach the truth of creation as presented in the Bible because I have faith. Look again at what it says in verse 3. 3. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Now listen, in case y'all didn't know this, maybe we'll get it straight here. I hold no faith whatsoever in the theory of evolution. I think the theory of evolution is the biggest farce that's ever been perpetrated on mankind. You can call me backwards and simple if you want to, that's fine. You're not going to change my mind because I know the word of God and I believe it. I believe the biblical account of creation, folks. I believe that God created the world and everything that we know, all of the cosmos, no matter how big it is, in six literal days. Six literal days, okay? And there are people, there are men and women, and, and, and they claim that they're Christians, and yet they say that they believe in evolution. They say that they believe that God created everything using evolution. And they even have this theory about how the six days of creation were actually these uh, ages of creation that, that uh, took over eons of time for God to do what he did to get to the place that we are. And that everything came about through evolution. And they've got it all worked out. They've got it all worked out just so that they can say that they believe in God, but also so that they can hold to the theory of evolution. Why? I can't understand why they would do this when they had the word of God right there before them. Why would anyone choose a man's theory over the word of God? That's what baffles me more than anything else. But, you know, preacher, why can't we believe this and why can't we believe that? And, 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 and I have to think it has something to do with a desire to want to be received and accepted by the world. Because that's what the world teaches, is it not? Why would Christians care what the world thought? That's what baffles me. I know I think that, that, that Christians trying to hold to evolution has something to do with, uh, you know, uh, Christians wanting people who don't believe in God, who hold to this theory of evolution, they don't want them to look down on us and call us simple and call us stupid. It doesn't matter what they call us. If you're not simple or stupid, who cares if they call you simple and stupid? <laughs> right? That makes me wonder. I mean, I'm always baffled by Christians. Why do we really care what people who are not Christians think about us? Listen, Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And then the Bible says this. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that does good. God says these people are literal fools. Literal fools. They are corrupt. They are immoral, seeing as they do abominable works. I, I, I say abominable. You know, you hear this word a lot in King James. And so I looked it up. The word abominable means this. Nasty and disgusting. That's the first two words in the dictionary. Abominable. Nasty and disgusting. Kind of like some of those cows yesterday. <laughs> we were running cows, and I was back there with Cheryl, and I was having a great time. I said, Cheryl, this is fun. And then this cow poop went. <laughs> Abominable. Yes. Yeah. Kind of stopped being fun at that point. <laughs> no, I, I really enjoyed it, Cheryl. I can't wait till the next, next time. <laughs> <laughs> right? The word abominable means nasty, disgusting. It means loathsome, disagreeable. It means something that is highly unpleasant. And, and it describes people who do very bad things. Straight from the dictionary, right? So the Hebrew word, looked it up. The Hebrew word is ta'ab. And you know what it means? Things that are abominable, nasty, disgusting, loathsome. All the things that I just described. Why? Would we care what anyone the Bible describes in this way thinks or believes? Right? And, and why would, he, would you even care about their opinion on anything? Again, the Bible describes them as fools. Oh, hold on just a second. I'm not sure what I should do. Let me go get a fool's opinion. 
right? Why would anyone give credence to what they say, what they believe? I mean, get this, and this should be a no-brainer for people in the church. Get this, they don't even believe in God. They don't even believe in God. Who cares what they think? Amen. amen. That's a good place for an amen, preacher. Sometimes you just got to amen yourself. You guys are just really into it, aren't you? Wake up, honey. No, I'm kidding. And these fools, they think that they're intelligent. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. That's what the Bible says. They think that they're intelligent. And they will assault us with their uh, questions, thinking that they have trapped us. Or in today's language, oh, he got slammed. Oh, they were crucified, you know. <laughs> that's, that's the way people talk today whenever you have a conversation with someone. Right? And they ask us questions. They think that they're going to trap us by what we believe. Do you really believe that God created everything in just six days? Why, yes. As a matter of fact, I do. You know, but I do have some reservations. Really, tell me about that. What really puzzles me is, what took him so long? Yes. What? Well, maybe he's God. That's right. Oh, you think about the earth and the animals and everything like that. He took his time with the earth and the animals and with human beings. But do you know how God created the cosmos? <coughs> That he just flicked his fingers in all the cosmos of this. What took him so long, right? Mm -hmm. Listen, if you profess to be a believer, right, and you want to believe that God created everything using this uh, theory of evolution, I have a question for you. <coughs> why, why would God ever create everything? Uh, by using a means through which man could theorize that everything came into existence without God. Evolution and the Word of God are diametrically opposed to each other. Amen. The theory of evolution was first postulated. By the way, Charles Darwin was a failed Methodist minister, in case y'all were wondering. The theory of evolution was first postulated to say that there is no God. Call me crazy. But I really think that God wants everyone to know that he exists. Amen. I mean, just look at all this evidence he left. Us. Right? Everything in the universe has a reason for existing. There's nothing that exists to which there is no reason. And if there's something that we think or we can't find the reason, it's not because God doesn't have a reason for it. It's just because we don't know what that reason is yet. But listen, um, here's a part of being a joy, uh, part of the joy of being a Christian God, God has allowed us the blessing of discovering how his universe works. Yeah. That's part of the blessing of being a child of God. He doesn't give you a, a complete knowledge of everything because he's given you opportunity to go out and find these things and discover these things. And to learn more about his creation and to learn more about him. What do you think that Adam and Eve were doing in the garden before they fell? Exploring the creation of God, tending to the creation of God, walking with God, learning more about God by personal relationship with Him, but also by the work that He gave them to do. <coughs> if everything exists for a reason, the reason behind the existence, the reason behind everything is God. Because without God, nothing has any reason for existing. God gives meaning to all of his existence. Without God, nothing has meaning. I mean, that's, a, that's how the Holy Spirit convinced me that I needed Jesus Christ. I couldn't, I couldn't grasp the meaning of life. Why in the world are we here? Because I was believing all the lies of the world, that there is no meaning or reason behind anything. And, and uh, I just couldn't wrap my head around this. You know, people are, who, who would say something like, um, you know, there is no God. And I don't need God to be a moral person. Well, if there is no God, why are you worried about being a moral person? Amen. Amen. If there is no God and there is no ultimate justice or ultimate judgment in all things, who cares how you live? Whether you think it's right or wrong. You see? And I couldn't wrap my head around that. And I couldn't wrap my head around why was I here? And I went to church and Jesus said, I'm the reason that you're here. I give meaning to everything. God gives meaning to all of our existence. Without God, every, uh, without God, nothing has any meaning. But with God, everything has meaning. Everything has purpose. 
And, and then you look at the universe and you see the harmony and the purpose and the order in the universe. And you see that everything in the universe displays intelligent design, which means something intelligent must have designed it, right? I mean, it's just like this planet is situated in just the right place in this galaxy to sustain life. And that just happened? Yep, I'm sure about that. <laughs> Timing and order and how things work. And the thing is, is that you can know all of this. You can know that God exists if you just take a good long look at everything around you and how everything is operating. And then there's these proponents of evolution, and they will argue, well, if we didn't evolve from lower life forms, why do we share so many common traits with animals? I love this question. <laughs> they say, oh, uh, now listen, you don't believe in evolution, but, but, but uh, you know, humans and animals, we're so similar. We breathe the same air. We eat the same food. We have sort of the same circulatory systems and vital organs and whatnot. And did you know that apes are only just a, uh, just a uh, what is it? Their chromosomes are like just 1% different than human chromosomes. But let me tell you something. A 1% difference is a big difference because they eat their poop and we don't. <laughs> you want to say, oh, humans and apes are closely related. No, no, they're not. I ate poop yesterday. It's not fun. <laughs> okay? It's a big difference. But they say, well, how do you explain the similarities? And so I love it when someone asks this question because the answer is so simple, I wonder how they could miss it. And then I remember, oh, yeah, they're fools. <laughs> Here's the answer. Why are we similar to animals? Because we're designed and created to live in the very same environment. Amen. 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 Designed. Uh, and created to live in this environment. We all live here on the same planet. So it stands to reason that we would breathe the same air, right? Wouldn't quite work if we did. And to eat the same things. And to have similar vital organs. The similarities between human beings and animals, they say, must mean that humans were at one time evolved. You know, they say that... that um, to say that the similarities between human beings and animals must mean that humans were at one time animals that evolved. That's like saying a crowbar must have started out as a screwdriver because they look kind of the same. That's the reasoning that you have in evolution. Well, because we share similarities with animals, we must have come from animals. Really, if we evolved from apes to what we are today, why are there still apes? If we evolved from animals, how come no other animals got to the point that we are in intelligence? Just human beings. Uh, it's so simple, right? The problem is this. As long as people desperately want to believe that there is no God, there's never going to be an end to the debate. That's right. Amen. How is it that I believe everything the Bible tells me about creation? I receive it by faith. Look at verse 3. Through faith. We understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so the things which are seen were not made of the things which do appear. Uh, do appear, excuse me. And now someone might be thinking, you know, someone who holds to evolution. Well, I've got you now. You say that you believe everything by faith. You have nothing but a blind faith. You don't have any evidence to back up what you believe. It's all fairy tales written down in this book because science has proven that evolution is true. How many of you have ever heard someone say that? You just want to. Science has not proven evolution to be true. Science can't prove origins, folks. No one was there to witness how the world and the cosmos came into being. No one was there except God, and he told us what happened. Right? But when you take into account all the evidence that we have in the world, the fossils, the mountain ranges, these great big gaping holes in the earth, like the Royal Gorge, which my wife was afraid to go up to the fence. Let's go to the fence and look over. No. Or the Grand Canyon. What you see is evidence of what the Bible says happened in the book of Genesis. Listen, when some paleontologist picks up a fossil and he begins to pontificate. So, well, this animal lived 240,000 million years ago. Just pick a number. It doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> And this animal, uh, he was a, uh, um, you know, he was a carnivore who ate this and that and the other. Of course, the Bible says that there was no death before the fall, so, uh -huh. right? And he says, and he had skin like this, and he had, and, 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 and not only that, but his entire species, they all hunted in packs, and they were highly intelligent. 
When they begin to pontificate about this fossil, all they're doing is expressing their imagination. They don't know! And a white lab coat doesn't make you all know it. Well, of course I know. I wear a lab coat and I have a badge. That's exactly what they want you to believe. They're just expressing their imagination. All the millions of dead things that we have fossilized around the world tells us at one time there was this huge cataclysm that created all these fossils, that created the Royal Gorge, that created the Grand Canyon, because you can see that it was created by a massive water, water runoff. Now, what do you suppose would do all that? And the point is, putting your faith in God is not a leap into the dark. It is a leap into the light. Putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that is a step into the light. But the problem, the problem is, is that man, apart from God, he doesn't seek God. Man, apart from God, doesn't seek God. Psalm 14, 2 and 3 says, The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They've all together become filthy. There is none that does good. No, not one. Romans 13, 11. There is none that understands. There is none that seeks after God. Man, apart from God, doesn't go looking for God. For the same reason a criminal doesn't go looking for a policeman. <laughs> right? Even still, our God is a seeking God. He's a seeking God. As we learned on Monday evening, our God is a rescuing God and Christianity is a rescue religion. Amen? Amen. A rescue religion. God is taking the initiative in Christ Jesus to rescue us from our sins. Throughout all the ages, God has been reaching out to his creation. We have the history of that in the word of God. God has taken the initiative in Christ Jesus to rescue us. He's taken the initiative through Christ Jesus to restore that relationship that was broken by sin. Our Father God, uh, it is true, He's holy and He's without sin. And sin cannot abide in His presence. But God is also full of mercy and grace and love. And so Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, came to this world. He had one mission, one destination. It was the cross. And that cross was to reconcile man and God through his flesh. Amen. He's a rescuing Savior. So Jesus went to the cross. The Bible says that he became sin for me and for you. Think of that. What that means is that he made himself the object of God's wrath for me. <laughs> And for you. He went to the cross. He took our sins upon himself. He took the punishment that we deserve. So that instead of God's wrath, we could receive God's grace Amen. and his love. In Christ Jesus, God satisfied his law and his love. At the same time, in the same person, so that we could be redeemed and our relationship could be restored. And the only way you're going to come to know what this means is to put your faith and trust in Jesus. Amen. That means you've got to trust that what he's done for you, everything that he's done is enough. And you call on his name by faith and receive him as your Savior and your Lord. Andrew, it doesn't take a mountain-sized faith to do this. The Bible says it only takes the faith the size of a mustard seed. All you've got to do is have enough faith to say something to the effect of, I don't know about all this, but you know what, Lord? I want to know the truth, and I want to know if this is true. That's right. And if you can honestly pray that prayer, I, 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 trust me, if you can honestly pray that prayer, if you want to know truth, God is going to reach down and expose you to the truth. But without that first step of faith, without that first step of faith, you're not going to come to know God. Without that first step of faith, you're just going to be left wavering between two positions your whole life. Is there a God? Is there not a God? I'm not sure. Well, it seems like this is the right way, but maybe this is the right way. Double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Just go through life racked with doubt. Without that first step of faith, Without faith, the Bible says it's impossible to please God. But listen, 
You can reach out. You can reach out in faith today. And I promise you, if you do, God will save you. Amen. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed. If you want to reach out to God this morning, if you've been wavering between two positions, you want to put an end to that, whatever doubt it may be, listen, if you'll just pray and say, Lord, assuage my doubts, he will. And the way to do that is simply pray a prayer, a simple prayer. It doesn't have to be anything that is uh, long or, or, or you don't have to be a theologian. All you have to do is just reach out, like I said, and say, Lord, I'm not certain. But I want to know for sure. That's what I prayed so many years ago. Lord, I'm not sure about all this, but I want to know the meaning of life. And if you're the meaning of life, please say it. If you'll pray something like that, I promise you, the Lord Jesus will save you. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, I pray for those who are on the point of decision right now. That they will call out to you by faith so that they can be saved. So that you'll become Savior and Lord in their life. And make all the difference in the world. The world that you created. The world that you created us to live on. I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand with me for just a